CBS News. The flu, pneumonia, whooping cough, hepatitis A, shingles, meningitis, tetanus. That's a scary list. But did you know immunizations can protect you from every one? You didn't? Well, we do. Rite Aid pharmacists are certified to immunize against the most common preventable diseases. Find out what immunizations you need with a free immunization evaluation at Rite Aid today. With us, it's personal. Availability and age restrictions apply in some states. See pharmacists for details. Geico Motorcycle presents Reflections from the Road. Every time I rev my engine down an open stretch of road, I'm glad I switched to Geico Motorcycle Insurance. Because nothing feels better than saving money with Geico. Except maybe the time I saved a life. A squirrel's life. Gave that little feller mouth to mouth and then he bit me. On second thought, saving money with Geico probably feels better. Geico Motorcycle Insurance. See how much you could... Hey, good afternoon. This is George Yates, and we're here with Justice for All on 1650 AM, and uh, we'll be here for the next couple of hours. I got a really uh, going to have a great show today. Uh, I've got two ladies here from uh, what's known as the Innocence Project. Those of us in the legal world know that uh, the Innocence Project has been around for uh, these these girls will tell us uh, the last couple of decades. Actually, those of you who remember the uh, O.J. Simpson trial, there were two lawyers involved in that. Uh, the DNA experts, uh, Barry Sheck and Peter Newfield. And after the uh, that trial, they they be really become more famous for uh, starting the Innocence Project, which over the last few years or last couple of decades has freed so many people from uh, wrongful convictions. Uh, through the use of DNA evidence. Um, years ago, DNA evidence wasn't available. So many people were convicted based upon false identifications, false confessions. But DNA evidence has come along to prove that, uh, you know, for certain of these people, they just weren't the, they weren't the guy. Uh, they, they had the wrong guy. Anyway, so uh, that's what, in, in this, it's been a very, very uh, dedicated and diligent effort by a lot of people working for the Innocence Project over uh, the last uh, few years. And um, the two people with us today, Katie Monroe is the uh, senior advocate for the National Partnership for the Innocence Project. And uh, also Sean Armbrus is with us today, and she is the uh, the regional director of the Mid Atlantic Innocence Project. So uh, we'd like to invite them to the show today. How are you? How are you guys doing? Great, thanks. How are you doing? Thanks, George. We're doing well. So anyway, uh, I guess I'll start with you, Katie. Uh, first of all, um, for those people that don't know, uh, they go Innocence Project. What is that? What is the Innocence Project? Tell us what it is. How long has it been around? How to get started? Uh, and um, and what do you do with the uh, with the Innocence Project? Great. Well, the Innocence Project is a, a national nonprofit organization. Um, the main mission of which is to identify people who've been uh, convicted uh, mistakenly, who are in prison and innocent, and to use DNA evidence to prove their innocence and free them from prison. Um, we also work on improvements to the criminal justice system to uh, improve uh, the way that investigations and trials happen to prevent the, the future conviction of, of, of innocent people and, and help identify actual perpetrators. And uh, we're part of a national network. Um, our, our organization is, uh, is, is located in New York City, although we work in states across the country um, on cases where DNA evidence can prove, uh, can prove actual innocence. But we're part of a national innocence network with regional organizations organizations that work uh, in the trenches in the states, including the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project, which covers uh, Virginia. And Sean Armbrist is the executive director of that project. So. And um, we, the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project is a separate nonprofit organization, and we are focused on working to prove the innocence of wrongfully convicted individuals um, using both DNA and other types of evidence of innocence in Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia. Well, how does somebody, uh, well, first of all, how long has the Innocence Project been around? Well, the Innocence Project in New York uh, has been around since um, uh, about the mid-1990s. I, I should know exactly when it was. 1992. 1992, 1992. And, um, and uh, nationally, um, uh, not just out of our organization, but nationally, um, our country just achieved its 321st 
DNA exoneration just this week. Um, um, and uh, we, uh, again, in Innocence Project, we work uh, only on cases where the DNA proves innocence, but uh, um, as, uh, as um, uh, what's been discovered is that DNA evidence is um, not available in most uh, post-conviction cases where a person is innocent in prison. Um, in fewer than 5% of cases is DNA act uh, evidence available to prove innocence. So that other piece of the work, the work that the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project does and, and uh, other regional projects do on cases where there isn't DNA evidence, that's, that's really important work as well. Well, now, you say only 5%. So if somebody is sitting there in jail and says, I didn't do it, uh, if they don't have DNA in their, in their case one way or the other, then you're really probably not going to be able to help them. Uh, well, the, the Innocence Project um, in New York, the, the national organization, is not able to help them. But that is part of why there have been so many regional innocence projects and state-based innocence projects that have sprung up across the country, um, in part to fill that gap. Um, it's tough to do the kind of legwork and investigation you need to do to develop non-DNA evidence of innocence from far away. But if you're on the ground, you can do that, and we've secured quite a few non-DNA exonerations in both Maryland and Virginia. Um, and there have been, you know, hundreds and hundreds throughout the country. So it is, it is harder, um, and it is more time-consuming. But it can be done if you have persuasive evidence of innocence. And we've seen in Virginia that we can actually get the agreement sometimes of the Attorney General's office, even in cases without scientific evidence. The, uh, how many people have been exonerated in Virginia? There have been, I believe, 16 DNA exonerees in Virginia. And within a few minutes, I will know the answer to the actual number of people <laughs> who have been exonerated in Virginia. It kind of depends on... How, how you count and who's counting. One of the exciting things in Virginia, George, is that there is a statute that allows a person who's innocent in prison to seek exoneration, um, you know, years after being uh, wrongly convicted, based on non-DNA evidence. Virginia is just one of four jurisdictions that have such a statute. And uh, every state now um, has a post-conviction DNA testing statute, which allows a person to prove innocence in a post-conviction setting based on DNA evidence, but Virginia is just uh, one of a, a very small number that has this this non-DNA uh, law that allows innocent people without DNA evidence to get back into court. So uh, Virginia um, has been, you know, somewhat of a leader uh, on um, in these non-DNA exoneration cases. And the Mid Atlantic Innocence Project is one of the, you know, one of the few that's been able to to secure um, formal, you know, official exonerations of uh, people in cases without DNA evidence. Well, how do you do that with, uh, with non-DNA? Do you have some other kind of scientific proof? Um, sometimes it's scientific evidence, um, but usually it's kind of an amalgam of different types of evidence. There's no one magic bullet in a non-DNA case. Um, just, you know, kind of, kind of an example from it's a Maryland case, but it kind of is a good it's a, it's a good benchmark for what these cases tend to look like. Um, it's a Maryland case in which our client was exonerated last February, and we had a combination of kind of scientific evidence that had been used to convict our client, and we proved that that evidence was sort of fatally flawed and actually didn't do anything to hurt our client. Um, a confession from the real perpetrator, um, some police documents that bolstered the confession, and then um, a new eyewitness who had been too scared to testify at the time of trial. So it's usually kind of a combination of evidence that takes a long time to secure. So you're, um, so you're saying in Virginia, a, a somebody that's in jail, wrongly convicted, under what statute? How do they go about doing that? Uh, do they, um, where do they file it? In the circuit court where they were convicted? Do they file it with the attorney general's office? Uh, how do they get started if they're, uh, you're, if you are got somebody that's in the jail and they say, I didn't do it, and you have some kind of new evidence? What's the procedure? How does it get started? So Virginia has a statute called the Writ of Actual Innocence for Non-Biological Evidence. And that is the statute that allows you to bring a claim of innocence um, based on non-DNA evidence that's been newly discovered. And the process in Virginia is a little bit unusual, but it has worked in some cases. Um, and what you do is you actually file in the Court of Appeals. So you don't go to the original trial court. Um, in Virginia, it's still true that the trial court loses jurisdiction of the case after 21 days. Right. So it goes to the Court of Appeals. 
And, if, you know, the Court of Appeals can send it back down to the trial court for fact-finding. But at the end of the day, the Court of Appeals is making the ultimate decision. Um, and you, you know, you serve both the Attorney General and the local Commonwealth's attorney, but it's the Attorney General's office that really gets to make the calls and actually files the responses. Um, and then if you lose in the Court of Appeals, you can appeal to the Supreme Court. And you have to have some uh, newly discovered evidence. You can't just go back and relitigate the original trial. You have to have something that's new, like uh, somebody's come along and said that they uh, that they did it. And uh, what what are what are some things that somebody would have to have that's newly discovered that would get them enough to file some kind of motion to get things going? It has to be something that that not only is newly discovered but could not have been discovered at the time of your trial. So, like, you can't, you know, suddenly say you had an alibi um, or, you know, you can't, you can't present evidence that you gave to your attorney and your attorney said, you know, that witness isn't very credible. Um, so it has to be something that you couldn't have discovered. And there are some different examples of things, you know, um, in the Thomas Hainsworth case where we won a writ of actual innocence based on non-biological evidence. Um, he had actually been convicted of three different crimes. DNA testing in one linked to a serial rapist who had been our client's neighbor and who looked an awful lot like Mr. Hainsworth um, and also committed the crimes in sort of an eerily similar way. And so the new evidence was DNA in another case and then the sort of similarities between the crimes and the, the extent to which the two men looked alike. Um, that's kind of a weird one, but it's an example. Um, you know, the real perpetrator confessing is an example. A new eyewitness is an example. Um, you know, this hasn't worked yet in Virginia, but we haven't tried it. Um, there are some cases out there, you know, arson cases and cases involving what's been known as shaken baby syndrome, um, in which the science underlying the convictions was pretty fatally flawed. And so, you know, one thing you could argue is that kind of new developments in science have helped prove your innocence now, um, right. and that couldn't have been discovered at the time of trial. Um, there's been most of the cases that have been litigated have involved witnesses who have recanted, and that is a lot tougher. Um, there has We won one case about a year ago in a case where a wit in a situation where a witness recanted, but it was a pretty narrow situation. Um, she actually recanted to police officers and was charged with perjury for her trial testimony and pled guilty. Was that the perjury. case in Hampton? Yeah, it was the case in Hampton. It was Jonathan Montgomery. Right. And so that's the only case so far in Virginia in which a recantation has been enough to win a writ of actual innocence. And that's not uncommon. And George, I would, this is Katie, I would add, I mean, I think it's important for, for listeners and everyone to understand that they're also, the evidence has to also speak to innocence, right? I mean, one of the, uh, probably one of the most difficult jobs of, of innocence organizations across the country, the Innocence Project, the Mid-Atlantic Atlantic Innocence Project, and others, is finding those cases not only where there's new evidence of actual innocence, but the, but the evidence actually goes to innocence. We, we hear from and, you know, uh, nationally, we, hear, we get uh, letters from thousands and thousands of people, you know, every year. Um, and uh, we have to look for those cases. You know, uh, people have all sorts of concerns about the way that their uh, trial played out or, or whether their conviction was lawful or not, right? But, uh, but we have to be able to we, – we only take the, the cases – um, uh, of people who are, are factually innocent, and uh, so we end up rejecting the vast majority of people who seek help. Um, you know, we really are the uh, kind of the 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 um, the, 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 the last um, avenue of hope for people who've been mistakenly convicted um, and you know are already sitting in prison, and uh, and we can only help a, 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 a you know very few of those. Partly because many of the people seeking help may not be innocent, but partly because that evidence of innocence is so difficult to uh, to uncover. Right, and it's you know it's not just someone who wasn't convicted of exactly what the government said they did. Um, you know, we recently had to have a really tough conversation with a guy who wanted our help. He had been convicted of being the primary shooter, and he wasn't the primary shooter, but he helped set up the crime and then helped hide the weapon. And so it's not you know it may not be fair that he was convicted of being the shooter, but at the end of the day, you know, if we're going to be the Innocence Project, we have to be sure that everyone we're helping really is innocent. Yeah, you can't, um, you can't go back. A lot of people will probably be writing you letters 
saying that there was reasonable doubt, but you need to have somebody that absolutely wasn't anywhere near the crime at the time. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a, that's a fascinating. You've just joined us. Uh, I'm George Yates. Uh, this is Justice for All, and I'm here with Katie Monroe and Sean Armbrust, and they're uh, one the national and the other the regional director of the Innocence Project that's freed 321 people. But uh, you know, the vast majority. What well, we have about two million people incarcerated in America. So this is still a very very small number of people that uh, that are ultimately innocent. Does that mean that the the other uh, um, the rest of all those people sitting over there in the prisons in, in America are are guilty, or you just can't uh, you can't help them all, can you? There's just not enough evidence to prove those that are wrongfully convicted or are innocent. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the hardest cases are the ones where we really do think someone's innocent, and at the end of the day, there's just not any way for us to prove it. Either the DNA evidence has been destroyed, the witnesses are dead, we can't find them. Um, or there's just something that looks really wrong with the conviction, but there's not any reinvestigation you can do that would prove innocence. And so, you know, there's been sort of a relatively small number of exonerations compared to the incredibly large prison population in the United States. But I don't think that's reflective of the true number of innocent people in prison. Um, And it also, I mean, it's a much higher number of innocent people than anyone ever really believed possible before DNA evidence became available. And it's kind of a window into what might be going on in the rest of the system. Because we're not getting guilt or innocence right, then what else is going wrong? Well, are you you ladies lawyers? Yes. Both of you? Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, what I mean, for those people that are just riding along in their car and listening to our show here today, what do you think overall of the American justice system? I mean, there are some mistakes made, and you've proven them wrong in many cases. But overall, does the system work? Uh, in many cases, of course, it doesn't. How would you improve the system so that these mistakes aren't made? Well, it's, you know, it's a, it's a complex answer. I would say, um, you know, one of the things uh, we find um, that's really important to talk about when talking about cases of innocence is, you know, the, the impact on all of us when the wrong person gets convicted and the right person, you know, the actual perpetrator goes free, which is what happens in these cases. We've actually uh, had a number of people in our community start to, 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 to call these cases wrongful liberty, right, because, the, 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 you know, the, the, the perpetrator is getting away and, and is, is left on the streets to commit um, additional crimes, which, of course, victimizes more people, and, 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 and the original crime victims um, don't get justice or finality and 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 the taxpayers uh, uh, their 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 um, the you know their precious resources haven't been put um, to good use and and it, it, it's something that we find doesn't get talked about enough is is how these mistakes um, uh, affect us all and um, and so all of the innocence organizations, the Innocence Project, the Middle Atlantic Innocence Project, and others um, are working on what we call front-end reforms, right? Um, uh, ways, uh, changes, improvements to police investigatory practices, um, improvements to trial practices that actually um, stand to increase the accuracy of the, the system to increase the quality of evidence and to reduce the likelihood of mistakes. And um, um, Sean may want to add to that, but you know we can we can share some of the the the, the, the policy improvements we're working on in Virginia. And, and I think overall, I mean, we have a very well designed system, um, but it's also a system that we've kind of overburdened and underfunded. Well, you've got, you've got these poor uh, defendants that are defended by a court appointed lawyer. Uh, who is underfunded, uh, doesn't uh, have the staff or the resources. Uh, he comes into a trial. Uh, you've got an eyewitness that says he's the guy. Uh, you got a jury over there that says, well, uh, he must be the guy because the eyewitness said he's the guy. And, uh, you know, and, and he gets convicted and he goes off to jail. And, um, it, 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 you know, and I'm wondering... When, when you look at this, and you've obviously looked at thousands of these cases, uh, why don't we just go through it one by one? I'm sure that there's miscarriages of justice all along the way. First of all, I want to say, you know, I've been trying cases in for 30 years now, and and for the most part, the system works. I mean, it's a great system. I'm sure it's got it's the best cr- criminal justice system on the planet. But you, uh, you, you folks investigate the the mistakes that have been made. So where do you where do the mistakes happen? Do they happen 
uh, with uh, poor defense lawyers. Let's talk about poor defense work, first of all. Where, where is there, and I don't, you don't have to name any names, but give me some examples of where the lawyer has just dropped the ball and didn't do a good job. Um, I think Marvin Anderson's case is a great example of that. Um, Marvin was exonerated based on DNA testing in 2001 after he'd spent 15 years in prison for a rape he didn't commit. Um, and he was accused of the rape, and his mom did some investigating and found out that there was a guy who, she, who you know, everyone in town was saying had really committed the crime. So she took it to Marvin's lawyer, and Marvin's lawyer didn't do anything about it, and nobody really understood why. And they found out years later that Marvin's lawyer had, was actually representing that guy in another case. Um, and lo and behold, when they did DNA testing, they found out that the guy Marvin's mom had thought was the real perpetrator was, in fact, the real perpetrator. Um, and his lawyer had a pretty significant conflict of interest that, you know, he didn't tell anyone about. Um, and that's kind, of, that's kind of the worst end. The wow. most typical end of it is lawyers who, you know, in Virginia up until recently, the statutory maximum for a felony case was four hundred dollars, and you can now get waivers, and you can get those caps waived. But you know, four hundred dollars. Uh, you have courts that don't fund experts, that don't fund investigation, and so if you're a defense lawyer, you've got to take an awful lot of cases to make a living. Tell me about it. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so when you're taking an awful lot of cases and when you're not able to get the resources from the court to investigate and to hire the experts you need, you can't do the sort of job you need to do. Um, and even if you wanted to, you couldn't do the sort of job you needed to do. Well, so in, in Virginia, I think, where do we rank in terms of what we pay our public defenders uh, or at least our court-appointed lawyers? We're way what, 48th, 49th? I know we're almost last in terms of how much we pay uh, court-appointed lawyers. Yeah, I think it's been historically 49th with West Virginia being 50th, but I don't I, – I, ha I haven't kept current on that statistic. You know, I think that there's been a big help in the recent years. I think since we've gone to the public defender system in a lot of our jurisdictions, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Chesapeake now, and that's not to disparage court-appointed lawyers. Uh, I don't do much court-appointed work uh, – um, and, but uh, because of that, it just doesn't pay well enough. Uh, right. yeah, but, uh, you know, since we've gone to the public defender system, I think that that's better uh, because, uh, you know, you've got a more of a team approach and you've got a more support amongst the public defenders in the office. And the younger lawyers have got support from the older ones and the senior ones. And and uh, and, and that's a big help. And, of course, we've also seen a big change in the way we've handled capital murder cases with the, the regional offices and, and so on. And that's, that's been a big improvement in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And I go to that capital defense seminar every year in November, you know, up in Richmond. And um, we're going to have to take a short break here. This is uh, Justice for All. I'm George Yates. And if you've just joined us, I'm here with Katie Monroe and Sean Armbrust. And we've been talking about the Innocence Project and how it frees uh, wrongfully convicted uh, felons from our prisons uh, uh, with the use of DNA and other types of uh, non-DNA scientific evidence. We're going to be coming right back here. We're going to talk about uh, this Marvin Anderson case. I'd like to find a little bit more about uh, how this lawyer uh, managed to uh, uh, do this with a conflict of interest and also some of these other mistakes that are made and how people get wrongfully convicted in our system. We'll be right back. Governments fear the individual. That's why governments tell you you can't do it. You are the next Martin Luther King. You are the next Gandhi. You are the next Abraham Lincoln. You are the next George Washington. Or you will be the next bum in the street. You choose. The choice of the individual is clear. It is there every single day. What do you choose today? Glenn Beck weekdays, 3 to 6 p.m. on KTalk 1650. Governments fear. For the very best in down-home music, join us on Saturdays, 11 a.m. for Ramblin' Ralph's Bluegrass Special with the authority on bluegrass music, Ralph Coleman. Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM1650 WHKT, Ramblin' Ralph's Bluegrass Special. 
Hello, this is Big Bear inviting you to visit myself and Grandma Bear at Little Bear's Consignment Boutique, where you'll find the best new and gently used children's brand name clothing and equipment. Clothing from newborn to teens. Dresses, suits, shoes, strollers, bassinets, toys, and anything else you need. Little Bear's is your stop. We even carry maternity clothes. Check us out on Facebook or stop in 200 North Battlefield Boulevard in the Harbor Watch Shops of Chesapeake near the locks. Little Bear's Consignment Boutique, where you're always greeted with a smile. The place for authentic Indian food is the India Palace. They feature authentic Indian cuisine, have a party hall, and do catering and banquets. Open daily for lunch and dinner, they showcase an excellent lunch buffet at their Chesapeake and Virginia Beach locations. Visit their two locations at 1437 Sam's Drive in Chesapeake off of Battlefield Boulevard and 5600 Virginia Beach Boulevard in Virginia Beach and online at IndiapalaceVB.com. On Facebook, look for India Palace Virginia Beach and India Palace Bar and Grill. Dine at the India Palace today. The restaurant we've all been waiting for is here. Introducing Ethan Mono Kitchen. Critically acclaimed chef Silva Sennett and his culinary team specialize in new American Asian cuisine. The very best in Chinese, Japanese, Thai food with an American flair. Open daily for lunch and dinner, Ethan Mono Kitchen is located inside the Patrick Henry Mall in Newport News. Call 249-0033 and log on to EthanMonoKitchen.com. Find them on Twitter at Ethan Mono. Okay, we're back with uh, Justice for All. I'm George Yates, and uh, we've got Katie Monroe and Sean Sean Armbrust here. And uh, the the lawyer in the Marvin Anderson case was he court appointed? Um, you know, I, I don't actually know the answer to that question. All right, and and did he ever face any kind of uh, discipline for that when he found out that uh, there was uh, evidence? Did he ever? Did he ever have a, what? What happened? Was there ever any follow up on that? There hasn't, to my knowledge, been resolution yet. Although I believe it's something that's still being dealt with in some way. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? I'm representing yeah. one client in a criminal case. I'm representing, uh, uh, th- then I and then I got another client that I'm hearing might have committed this particular crime, and I'm, that's a very interesting ethical dilemma, isn't it? Yeah, I mean it's it's sort of a textbook conflict. Yeah. What do you do? Um, yeah, you withdraw. You have to withdraw from one of them, perhaps from both. I don't know. Yeah, and then you you you, you have to then uh, and you, you maybe have to report it to somebody, and then you're not really giving away a client confidence. If you are representing this one client, you're not responsible for it's a it's a past crime. He hasn't conveyed you any information about the case, uh, so it would seem that you have to get out of uh, of of them and uh, and then say i've got a conflict here if in fact there's anything to it that's the problem i mean if just mom comes to you and says uh oh i think this other guy did it i mean you know what do you, what's that you can't do it based upon that what what evidence did mom give uh the lawyer do you know if um you know that there may have been something to show him that there maybe there was something uh to it if you know you know, I don't know exactly what the evidence was. Right. Okay. Let's let's go on from lawyers. Let's because uh, we're having a little fun here. Um, how about judges? Have you seen any just absolutely egregious examples of judges that have allowed evidence to come in that shouldn't have come in, or made comments on the evidence, or done something in such a way to end up with a wrongful conviction? Uh, give me a good example of that if you have one. You know, I don't have a great example of that in the trial courts. Um, You know, we get involved in the case kind of after someone's already been convicted, and we're looking at sort of a cold trial record that doesn't really give you a great sense of what was happening kind of on the ground. Right. Um, But, you know, I think one thing, and this isn't necessarily the fault of judges, although it's sort of part of the system they're in, I think one thing that has historically been a problem, although, again, I think Virginia's making a lot of strides, has been kind of the emphasis on finality over justice. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a sentiment among a lot of judges, I think in large part because they're inundated with some pretty baseless, you know, litigation a lot of the time, um, that, you know, it's better to have the case just be over with than to bring in new evidence of innocence. And I think it's been really controversial in Virginia to sort of allow new evidence of innocence to come in. But I think people are starting to get used to it more. 
Um, I think there was a lot of resistance to it at the beginning, but I really do think that is starting to change. And from what I've seen, you know, most of the judges take their role pretty seriously. You know, even if they rule against me, um, they're usually taking their job seriously. Well, and now, doing- and that's, yeah. I think that that's, you talk about Virginia being, having a statute which allows you to have this actual innocence writ. Uh, that's recent, isn't it? I mean, how many years has it been since that statute's been on the books? I believe it was passed in 2004. Yeah, I mean, um, so within the last 10 years. Now, before that, you were absolutely SOL if you had actual innocence, right? I mean, yeah. they, they, there was a finality of judgment. They would say, that's it. We don't care what evidence you have. We don't care uh, if it's absolute 100% proof that you didn't do it. It's too late, right? I mean, that's the way it used yeah. to be before that writ, yeah. right? Yes, and and so that absolutely. is an enormous step forward that Virginia's done that, and that was 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so that's great, because I can recall there was a time uh, that there was just ap- you were just out of luck. Um, yeah, and and- what, I mean, the other great thing that's happened in Virginia is I think there's been, it hasn't happened everywhere, but I think there's been a real cultural shift among prosecutors and, um, and the attorney general's office in these cases. Well, I was so impressed I that, uh, you- that Cuccinelli... Uh, you yeah. know, who, who ran for governor and, and had all those kinds of problems. But uh, I was impressed that he actually gave, was it Marvin Anderson that he gave the job to? It was Thomas Hainsworth. Thomas Hainsworth. He actually, mm-hmm. this was our <laughs> former attorney general, uh, who caught a lot of flack, was considered right wing and all of that kind of stuff. And you wouldn't expect that from him, you know, the law and order, so on, you know. And wow, uh, here's a wrongfully convicted fellow, and uh, he gives him a job in the attorney general's office. That was just an amazing um, story, isn't it? Yeah, and it, and it, it was it was a, an absolutely amazing story. And it was, um, you know, Thomas before he was fully exonerated, we were able to get him out on parole. Um, and General Cuccinelli wanted to meet with him the next day, so I went with Thomas to meet with him. And you know, he apologized to Thomas on behalf of the Commonwealth. And I can tell you that most exonerees never get an apology from anybody, let alone the chief law enforcement officer in the state. Um, and he, you know, he said, "If you need anything, call me." And you could tell that he meant it. Um, and when we needed something and we called, Thomas had a job two days later. Um, so he really, it was, you know, whatever his politics are in other areas, he is absolutely, he was absolutely sincere in his desire to do the right thing in this case. Well, and George, you mentioned law and order, and, um, you know, we actually find, I mean, first of all, this issue of, you know, getting the right person in prison is not a, it, it's not an issue that, that, that falls on, you know, either the left or the right side of the aisle. It's, it's an issue that, and, you know, that, uh, that um, is important to us all, and, 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 and so usually it does cross party lines when we're talking about, you know, an innocent person in prison and the actual perpetrator still free and the crime victim hasn't received justice and so on and so forth. But we also find that, you know, within... Um, you know, more uh, conservative communities, this, this issue resonates for other reasons as well, right? I mean, you know, we've got, we're talking about a, a mistake by the government, right? We're talking about, um, you know, an absence of accountability on the part of the government. We're talking about, you know, taxpayer money that, uh, that has gone to fuel a system that gets it wrong, you know, that, that's, 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 that's flawed. And, um, and uh, so, um, you know, it shouldn't be surprising that um, Attorney General Cuccinelli, uh, you know, was interested in um, the possibility that Mr. Haynes was innocent, and then when he found out that the evidence was there, that he wanted to, you know, that the, 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 the office advocated on his behalf, and our hope is that, you know, more and more it will be understood that this is an issue that is, um, that, uh, is, is, should naturally be important to law enforcement officials, prosecutors, judges, and others. Right, and, then, and I think, you know, a ton of credit goes to the Indigent Defense Commission um, because they have done a great job of training lawyers throughout the state. And I think when, you know, one side of the table, you know, so to speak, kind of raises its game, um, it forces everybody to do a better job. And so I think, you know, as the defense bar in Virginia um, does a better job, you know, it's, it, it, and I guess it's better funded to do its job, um, you know, prosecutors have to do a better job. And I think people think more critically and more carefully about these cases. Well, yeah, and, you know, I the – the role of the government is to get justice and the the role of the prosecutor is to make sure that justice is done and there's that old expression that you know when a de- when a defendant is um, is found not guilty well then the system is worked because uh, you know that's 
the innocent are supposed to go free or the not guilty are supposed to go free. And uh, so often there is a, a tendency for us to believe, and I'm sure there's plenty of prosecutors that think that they need to win at all costs. And they, um, and it's it's a tragedy, but that does happen so often. What do you do? You ever see in, in some of your cases where I mean, let's face it, you've got a terrible crime, you know, a serial rape uh, type situation going on, and so you know you've got a you got to need to bring someone to justice, right? Because otherwise the community is up in arms. This rapist is, is out there. And so what happens? Well, the local police department just goes out and gets the first guy they can find, right? And say, we've caught him. Most people see it in the paper and go, okay, he's, he's off the streets. And you've, you've raised that alarm already, Katie, that, uh, now it, the public perception is that this rapist has been caught and everybody breathes a sigh of relief. Uh, but actually they've got the wrong guy and the real rapist is out there still continuing or the or murderer or worse is still out there. And uh, that's, that's uh, unfortunately I think that does happen because the there's pressure on the police department to go catch the guy. Yeah. And we've been able, I mean, one of the, you know, in addition to uh, DNA evidence being able to identify that an innocent person is in prison, you know, it also has the capacity to identify the actual perpetrator. So in, uh, in just about 50% of all of the 321 DNA exonerations, that same biological evidence, um, you know, that was left by the perpetrator at the, at the, at the crime um, and, uh, and collected and preserved and tested, that same evidence which identified uh, uh, the innocence of the person in prison, identified the actual perpetrator, and we've been able to, um, in those, uh, across that 50% of cases, we've been able to show that those perpetrators went on to commit um, hundreds of additional rapes and uh, and murders. Um, and, you know, it's important to, to say that, you know, innocence organizations are, are focused uh, mostly on rapes and murders, right? I mean, we've been able to, DNA evidence has allowed us to branch out and look at other, um, um, some other violent felonies, but, but uh, you know, we're not looking at the vast majority of cases that come through the system, right? Um, it, we really are looking at these most heinous cases. So um, we don't know what the numbers are there in terms of, of wrongful convictions and, uh, you know, perpetrators continuing be on, to be on the streets um, and committing more crimes. But we do have the data in those cases where DNA has, uh, has demonstrated who the actual perpetrator was, and we have the numbers of the additional rapes and murders they committed. You know, when I first when I first started trying cases back in the early 80s, I was a prosecutor and, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have DNA in those days. We would use things like uh, you would get somebody's blood type. If you had a rape case, let's say you would have, you would have uh, a seminal fluid or something like that. And at the best you could do would be the serology reports. And you would end up getting whether or not there was a t blood type and you whether there were a secretor or not. And and that would be it. And then occasionally you might have hair fiber, you know, that kind of hairs, which I mean, I've I've seen people testify. Some of these hair experts will come on and say that a, a hair is like DNA. You know, sometimes they, you would get these experts that would come on and they just were not. You know, a hair is just not DNA, but they would try to make it out like it was that accurate. And then these serology reports, you know, that was the best we could do. Uh, and so you would end up, and is that what uh, now? It, now, of course, DNA began to come along towards in the you know mid to late 80s, and then it got better and better. So uh, are a lot of your people that, that you've been exonerating, they've done, they've done time for a long, long time, I would guess, because otherwise the, the DNA would not have been uh, – their DNA would have been available if they're tried in the 90s, let's say. These are people that have been there a long time, right? Yeah, for the most part. Um, Mr. Hainsworth, for example, served 27 years. Um, we just obtained DNA testing in a case in Virginia Beach where, you know, we don't yet know whether he's innocent or guilty. That's why we're doing the testing. Um, but he has been in prison for 40 years. So, and there was an exoneration out of North Carolina yesterday where the, uh, the, the gentleman spent 40 years in prison. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, the average is, uh, is 13 years, um, but uh, we do have, uh, we have clients who've been freed um, after as many as 40. And, um, you know, combined, we're talking, of course, about thousands and thousands of years uh, wrongly imprisoned um, by this community of people. Um, you know, though, we don't, uh, we don't always see that just because 
DNA evidence is available before trial, that that nat necessarily um, excludes an innocent person either. I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, that that, that go on in a police investigation in a trial, and uh, we have seen cases both pre-trial and uh, in the post-conviction setting what, where the biological evidence uh, from the victim or from the scene doesn't belong, you know, to the innocent person or the, to the person claiming innocence, but for some reason state officials still believe in the guilt of that person. Um, and so it doesn't, uh, uh, it certainly um, helps to have that DNA evidence available before trial. Um, and most of the cases that we've worked on have involved, you know, uh, convictions that happened long before DNA evidence was available. But, um, but we still face, we still face um, difficulties even when we have DNA evidence that uh, excludes a client, um, but the system, you know, the 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 the, the, the system is still intent on uh, trying them or and or keeping them in prison. Right, and, and that and, and that's the that, isn't that kind of the scary uh, situation, right? Let's say somebody maybe ten, fifteen years ago, there was DNA evidence that exonerated them, but still they were convicted. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's a controversial case in Virginia, but the Norfolk Four case out of Virginia is right. a pretty good example of that. Um, you know, all four of the men who were convicted of that crime were excluded, um, and the person who was, you know, sort of more credibly confessing to the crime, saying he did it alone and had no connection to the guys who were convicted, matched the DNA, um, and they were all still convicted. And, you know, one of them um, has had his name cleared through federal habeas, but most of them still remain con convicted sex offenders. Yeah, and that was the Bosco case, right, in Norfolk? Exactly, exactly. So, uh, now, how does this happen? Um, is it mostly false identification evidence, then, that convicts these people, uh, for the most part? Uh, or uh, or, or what, uh, what, else is, what else is it? I mean, there wasn't DNA evidence that convicted them, or was it? Um, well, there's, there's actually one DNA exoneree who was convicted based on DNA evidence, but it was very early DNA testing. Um, it's a guy out of Texas. But for the most part, you know, the, the number one cause of wrongful convictions in DNA cases is eyewitness error. Um, and there are a lot of things that can be done to sort of make eyewitness testimony more accurate and make eyewitness identifications more accurate. Um, the National Academy of Sciences just re released a report a couple of weeks ago um, kind of endorsing what the Innocence Project and Innocence Projects around the country have been advocating for for about a decade now. Um, so eyewitness error is one major cause of wrongful convictions. False confessions are a significant cause of wrongful confessions, convictions. Um, you know, bad or flawed forensic science, so the hair testimony you were talking about has been a huge factor that's contributed to a lot of wrongful convictions. Um, informants. So, you know, most people don't want to testify in criminal trials because there's not much to gain. Um, so a lot of the time, the people who testify, who aren't eyewitnesses, um, are incentivized to do so based on, you know, sentencing reductions, charges being dropped, favorable treatment in prison, whatever it is, and the police need that tool to get people to be able to, to talk to them. Um, but it also means that that testimony may be tainted and some people have, some people lie. Um, you know, there are um, a lot of reasons why prosecutors and police don't necessarily turn over evidence that they're supposed to turn over. It's a pretty complicated problem, um, but that's contributed to a number of wrongful convictions. And then kind of the overarching theme in a lot of them, and I think it's particularly relevant to the Norfolk 4 case, is tunnel vision. Um, and it's, you know, tunnel vision is something that infects all of us in every walk of life, um, but it's particularly bad in the criminal justice con context. So what it means is that once you've decided on, you know, on your theory, whether it's, you know, your theory when you're fighting with your spouse um, or whether it's your theory in a criminal investigation, you interpret everything to fit your theory. And so in the Norfolk 4 case, you know, you just, you saw it playing out where, you know, they thought guy A did it. Well, guy A didn't do it. It must have, guy A must have had guy B, with, get, must have had a second guy with him. Okay, well, the second guy isn't implicated by the DNA. They both clearly did it. So there must have been a third guy. 
Um, and you end up with these cases where in a lot of ways it looks like people are crazy or they must have been doing it intentionally. But, you know, by and large, the vast majority of these cases aren't intentional. Um, they're people who have screwed up. And they've screwed up pretty profoundly a lot of the time, but they've screwed up. Um, and a lot of it is that they think they're doing the right thing and they think they have the right answer. So in their head, they shape the evidence to fit their answer or to fit their theory. You mean you're talking um, about the prosecutor or you're talking about the, uh, the, 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 the defendant when he's, when he's being questioned? Um, mostly. So you see it a lot of times with, with law enforcement investigations. You know, once the police decide on a theory, it's really hard to walk back from that theory. Right. Um, just psychologically. You know, it's not anything specific to police officers. It's something specific to humans. That once you've made a decision about the direction you're going to go, it's really hard to reverse course midstream. Um, and so it infects every area of the system. I mean, you see law enforcement officers with tunnel vision. You see prosecutors with tunnel vision. You see defense lawyers with tunnel vision. Um, you know, you often see that when a client, when a defendant confesses, um, everybody thinks they're guilty, including their own lawyer. Um, so it's something that infects kind of every, every area of the criminal justice system. And in every single one of the wrongful conviction cases I've seen, it's been kind of one of the common threads. And it tends to paint, it taints the way, you know, once you assume someone's guilty, almost anything that they do appears guilty, right? So the, so so some of the most innocent conduct can 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 appear guilty once you if, if you assume that that if you've already decided that person is guilty or may be guilty. And we see it in cases so you know like really uh, uh, simple behavior like whether somebody cries or not or whether somebody cries enough or not or whether somebody um, uh, you know, it just kind of really, I mean, just everyday activities. Um, if the person has been, if, if the theory is that that person is responsible for the crime, then what might ordinarily be just uh, very ordinary behavior is suddenly seen um, through a filter of guilt. And uh, and again, it is just it, it's 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 a it's a human. You know, it's 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 uh, it's a very um, it's a very human um, a habit, just like. Uh, um, mistaken um, eyewitness identification. It really just is the way that our, our mind work, right? We, we uh, um, you know, we are, our, our brains um, uh, tend to be very subjective in the, um, in the, uh, the, the, the things that we think and the decisions that we make. And, um, and so this tunnel vision, it uh, tends to start with the police investigation. And, um, and, and it, in these wrongful conviction, conviction cases, it follows straight through the trial through the appellate process, you know, into the post-conviction setting, and even sometimes when, you know, we have a single perpetrator rape case, you know, where it was known from the beginning that there was just one perpetrator and the DNA evidence uh, from the victim comes back and, and excludes the innocent person, you know, the person who's been claiming innocence, um, we can still often see that the system will say, well, we still think you must be guilty. Even though you didn't leave the biological evidence, it still must be you. Um, and so that tunnel vision uh, tends to run the, the spectrum of the, of the criminal justice system. And it's probably one of the hardest things to, to fix. If you've just joined us, we're talking uh, with two representatives of the Innocence Project, and that's the, the national group that has been dedicated um, now over 20 years to uh, assisting those who've been wrongfully convicted uh, to uh, uh, exonerate themselves from their crimes by the use of DNA evidence. Uh, for many of them, the DNA evidence wasn't available when they were convicted, and for some of the others, the DNA evidence wasn't properly um, preserved or, or examined or brought to trial. Uh, and my one of my questions, uh, ladies, is is uh, this DNA evidence? Um, it, it, you just got somebody off that had been in prison for forty years. Are you telling me that they were still able? I mean, all of this, uh, uh, whatever the stuff was from that crime scene, had been preserved and stayed in one spot. I and mean, we've got people that have been in prison for twenty years, and they can still go back and and go find uh, the samples in the blood or the s seminal fluid or whatever from the crime. I mean, where is that what happens? That all this stuff has been preserved? Um, well, it's, it's hit or miss. It, it's a little bit like cleaning out your basement. You know, you probably should clean out your basement, but you don't always get around to it. Um, you know, prior to there being DNA evidence available to testing cases, 
there wasn't really any reason for courts and police departments to keep this evidence around. It just took up space. Um, but we've been lucky, in a sense, in a lot of these cases that it has been preserved. Um, in most cases, it isn't. In most cases, it has been destroyed. We can't find it. Um, but in some cases, we're very lucky, and it's in a court clerk's office or in a file. Um, in Virginia, we've been incredibly lucky that there were a couple of analysts, one in particular at the Virginia Department of Forensic Science, who saved little clippings of evidence. So normally in a criminal case um, in Virginia, all law enforcement agencies send their scientific evidence to the Virginia Department of Forensic Science. And in most cases, the department sends the evidence right back when they're done testing it. Um, but one analyst in particular, along with a couple of others, would take these teeny little cuttings. I mean, we're talking like not even a square centimeter, like half a centimeter square of underwear or, you know, swabs from a rape kit um, and tape them down to lab sheets and save them in there. And um, it was discovered in Marvin Anderson's case that this had happened in his case. And now there have been, I believe, seven people exonerated. If I, I may be counting wrong. I can't remember the exact number, but, you know, at least seven people exonerated based on um, the evidence that had been saved there unexpectedly. I had a guest on my show, Nick Yaris, who spent 21 years up on uh, Pennsylvania's death row. Fascinating uh, character. He uh, um, just written a book called uh, Seven Years to Live. Um, actually, I wrote it several years ago, but it just recently was published. He was, the, I think, the very first person in the country to uh, start having, uh, I think it was, it was 1986 or Whenever and it just took forever before he finally had his. Well, how come it took so? Are you familiar with his case and 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 maybe we can talk about Yaris's case a little bit if you know it. And if not, once somebody let's say grabs your interest and you begin testing it, what's the process? How long does it take? I know for him it took 15 years before the DNA evidence was finally uh, in a position to clear him. Uh, what's the normal time frame? And, and tell me if you know anything about that Yaris case. Uh, I'm not. I mean, I know I know who he is. I know a little bit about him, but I don't know much about his case. Um, there isn't really any normal in these cases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have the, the case I mentioned where we found the biological evidence that's 40 years old. I mean, we've only been working on that for a few months. The evidence is already being tested. Um, we got an exoneration about a year and a half ago in a case where the client had been looking for the biological evidence since the early 1990s. I believe he spent, I think we counted that he spent 17 years looking for the evidence. We were the third Innocence Project to represent him. Wow. Um, and none of the other projects had done anything wrong. They'd hand-searched warehouses and evidence. Um, just so happened that finally we, it was found. Unbelievable. Um, and it exonerated him. And, well, you know, and, and, 17 and years? 17 years before they could find the evidence to exonerate him and they found it? Yes. How in the world? Why, why does it? How? I, I'm <laughs> shocked. I mean, that's gonna, you know, there could be all sorts of reasons. I, they're, they're, you know, in, in, in Nick's case in particular, um, you know, we, we, just, we, we just got you know, the, 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 all of the states now to uh, have post-conviction DNA testing statutes. Right? Prior, to, prior to having these statutes on the books, it wasn't, there wasn't a, a, a legal mechanism by which somebody could seek DNA testing and be exonerated by DNA testing, right? So it took a long time to get these statutes on the books, and now we have these legal mechanisms in every state. So, that, so that's part of it. And then, of course, in each state, that legal mechanism looks different, right? I mean, you might have to petition to get testing and then come back, depending on the results, and petition for something else, and, and maybe you're exonerated at that point, or maybe the remedy you get is a new trial. It, it looks different in every state, but um, uh, I was uh, working out in um, – the Rocky Mountain region before this, and uh, we had a case where um, we looked for years uh, to find um, the, 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 the rape kit, the, you know, the biological evidence from the case, and um, we were able to trace it as far as the crime lab, um, but the crime lab, uh, they were very cooperative. They weren't resisting uh, uh looking for the evidence, and that does happen. We know often um, it takes a, a pretty persistent legal process to get someone to even 
um, uh, provide the evidence for testing, but in this case, we had a very cooperative lab. But we, we, we looked for years, and um, and finally we had to stop looking because the, we, we, we met, um, we kept meeting the same dead end, and uh, eventually we got a call out of the blue from the uh, original investigating officer in the case who said, um, you know, I, I understand you've been poking around in this case. You know, I think this guy's guilty, but I, but if you want, I, I've got all of the uh, the case files in my garage at my home. I mean, I've been retired for a while, but they're just sitting out there. If you want to come out here and take a look and go through them, you're more than welcome. So oh, we went out, we, we, we went through the garage, and uh, we were able, we didn't find the actual biological evidence, but what we did find was the full the, the fullest chain of custody. We were able to, to show without any doubt that the um, the evidence had been returned to the crime lab and filed among their files. So we went back one last time and said, you know, look, we can show without, you know, there's, if you haven't destroyed the evidence, it still has to be there, barring some huge mistake on your part. And sure enough, they went back and looked, and it had just, it was misfiled. It was, it was in the wrong case file in the, in the, in the, um, in the crime lab's, uh, um, you know, files, and we were able to, to, to then, you know, pull the, the, the evidence and get it tested, and, uh, and our client was exonerated. Um, but, you know, that's unbelievable. Sort of- we're going to take a short break here. Uh, Katie Monroe and Sean Armbrust, Innocence Project Directors, and we're with Justice for All. I'm George Yates. We're going to take a break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the wrongfully convicted that were on death row that have been exonerated by DNA evidence. We'll be right back. Yes. What it really is is an intentional effort to keep certain people, particularly based on race and ethnicity, from voting. And it's unfortunate, and it's unfortunate now that it's going to be in effect. To vote in Texas, you can use a driver's license as ID, a gun license, a military ID, or a passport, not a four-year college ID. President Obama is sending help to Texas to keep track of the Ebola virus. Correspondent Juliana Goldman. Late last night, the president announced a new team he's formed and is dispatching to Dallas. They'll oversee the task of monitoring and identifying everyone who has come into contact with the three people diagnosed with Ebola. Canada says it will begin shipping its experimental Ebola vaccine to the World Health Organization for distribution. In England... British Prime Minister Cameron sent a letter to 26 European Union leaders designed to shame them into donating $1.3 billion to fight the Ebola epidemic. He made it clear most countries aren't doing their share. Cameron tells his European counterparts 20,000 cases of Ebola are forecast by the end of next month, and he insists an ambitious support package must be agreed at a Brussels summit next week. Britain has donated $200 million, the second highest amount after the U.S. Larry Miller, CBS News, London. Catholic bishops are moving the welcome mat a little farther away from gay worshippers. Deep divisions have emerged among the Catholic bishops attending the Synod on the Family at the Vatican. At the end of a two-week meeting, they failed to approve a more open approach to gays and divorcees. A revised document laying out the church's position was approved and this will serve as the basis for future debate. Another meeting of bishops will be held in a year's time. Sabina Castelfranco, CBS News, Rome. Downed palm trees block the roads, power's out everywhere. Part of the roof gone from the main hospital. But the U.S. Consul General in Bermuda says a direct hit by Hurricane Gonzalo could have been a lot worse. We're really, really fortunate. The, the uh, as the phrase go, dodged a bullet. No serious injuries, and there were.